Welcome to the Beta Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now, your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bill Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Thanks for joining me once again on this Saturday night. Uh, we're here tonight talking about the guidelines for an African economic ideology, paper by uh, Igosa Osaji uh, from the University of Ibadan. Uh, let me just make sure everything's correct here. Looks like it. Okay. So, before I get into reading the papers, as is customary here, I want to remind you guys that this is a part of a podcast network. The Bit of Medicine podcast is a part of the KWAZ podcast network. And I'd like you guys to check out some of the shows, you know, in fact, all of the shows on the podcast network. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And there it is. You know, check out the shows on uh, KWAZ Radio, which also includes the Queen's Council as well. Check out the Queen's Council, Pro Black Perspective, and the Harsh Reality Podcast. In fact, the Harsh Reality Podcast uh, just had a new episode up last night. Make sure to check it out. It's a pretty good episode. And the uh, Pro Black Perspective had an episode earlier today, which after which after you listen to this show, show tonight, go and check out uh, the show from the Black the Pro Black Perspective earlier today, and uh, the Harsh Reality Podcast from last night. Two excellent shows. Okay, so. Once again, we're discussing the guidelines for an African economic ideology. Uh, before I go on, let me just take a minute here to make sure everything is set up nicely. Just hang with me one minute. Just making sure everything is set up right. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like looks like I'm cooking with gas. Okay. Okie dokes. So we're good here. And if for some reason you guys can't hear me, let me know so I can fix that, okay? Um so let's start the reading. So once again, like I said before, we are reading um, this paper called Guidelines for an, for an African Economic Ideology. And th you know, th this paper selection came from the last conversation we had. We had two conversations. One was about uh, how can Africa go about creating its own economic ideology? Uh, freeing itself from 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 European ideologies that doesn't do anything for it, um, you know, be it capitalism or, or social or sorry uh, socialism, and and the other uh, the other question we had from the last episode was exactly how do you go about 
unifying uh, the continent. We always hear that term thrown out there, but we never, we never hear uh, exactly how, uh, how we're gonna go about creating, you know, this unity. So let's see if we can tackle uh, both issues, or, or, or at least one of the issues in this paper. So paper begins, former colonial countries in Africa are predominantly underdeveloped. They're characterized by inadequate economic infrastructure and real capital investment far short of the level necessary for accelerated development. Personal incomes, especially of rural dwellers and urban wage earners, sorry, uh, can barely provide for the needs of the most puritanical existence. These countries are characterized mm -hmm. by unjustifiable inequalities in the ownership of national wealth, the distribution of annual income, and the opportunities for the acquisition of formal education. To further complicate matters, the competition for the distribution of meager national incomes gives rise to ethnic conflicts, which seriously endanger national, uh, national integration and unity. Generally, these countries are heavily dependent on former metropolitan powers for their supply of imports, the disposal of exports, budgetary um, subventions, uh, budgetary subventions, capital inflow, and skilled technical manpower. These economies are predominantly controlled by foreign-owned businesses and by minority, my, uh, minority immigrant groups. The majority groups, accustomed to having all of their economic and social needs met by foreigners, develop a resigned attitude to economic participation and, in some cases, are afflicted by inferiority complexes. Even the elites fail to develop new ideas and modes of analysis useful in the solution of national problems. Right? Instead, there is the naive and simplistic embrace of foreign ideologies and solutions to problems which are generally irrelevant and inapplicable to African solution, uh, African condition. The realization of this fact calls for a new mode of thinking, new structures, new institutions. Above all, it calls for a distinctively African ideology. And this is, a, this is a good intro to this paper. And if you listen to uh, the pro-black perspective earlier this afternoon, you, you would have heard of this, uh, this white guy, um, you know, talking about the reason why Africa is in the state it is. This is, this is the gist of it. The reason why Africa is how it is, is because Europeans can't allow Africa to be autonomous. Right, and of course we, you know, if, you, if you've been paying attention, you know this. The problem is that we have a problem with the elites in Africa, right, who, who, who don't develop new ideas, who go with the, you know, the long, the long trodden, you know, uh, ways of doing things, which comes from the, the former colonizers, right? And we don't have the right education that brings up a new set of Africans who will go about the task of completely overthrowing, uh, it, you know, a Africa's oppressors and, and completely coming up with new ideas, not only to throw them off of their backs, but to keep these oppressors off their backs. You know, and so this is the problem that we face. These economies, these African economies, are predominantly controlled by foreign-owned businesses and by minority Im immigrant groups, right? The small, the small little enclave of white boys and white women in these African countries rule the shit. And by the way, this is not, this is also not untrue in the Caribbean, right? 
the reason why you have you know folks from the caribbean moving and speaking a certain way and even well probably even more so than africans to a certain extent uh at the very least at an equal extent is that in those caribbean countries you are not totally dominated by whiteness in that in your everyday life there isn't a white boy who you have to go to 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 you know for for for, for every you know every single like if you go to pump gas there isn't a white boy there for you to have to directly get your gas from you go to church there isn't a white boy there who was at the church there isn't a white boy who's the doctor who's your lawyer and that's one of the differences between uh what has happened you know to the american african versus the caribbean african and i dare say um i dare say uh even the continental african although the continental african being so i think the proximity to the resources is what causes them to to have to see these white folks more and more and i think that's what causes some of the skirmishes that you hear about like with the boars and stuff like that in the continent but in the caribbean you don't have a daily you're, you're not faced daily with a white guy the truth though is that these white guys are the invisible hand behind the goings on in the country so okay so this paper then takes us to the importance of an ideology shout out to you guys who are listening with me here i see a few of you are here uh, no activity in the chat room yet that's cool make sure you guys give me a thumbs up on the video and if you're new here make sure to subscribe click the bell to be notified when i'm online again like i've been trying to keep up with i'm usually online every uh tuesday thursday and saturday but still click the bell so that you know uh for sure if i'm online or not so the importance of an ideology the economic and social problems confronting african nations call for urgent and effective solutions they require well thought out and consistent programs developed by dedicated leaders who themselves are guided by certain ideological guidelines these ideological considerations need not be rigidly doctrinaire. They need not be specific enough to help, na to help national leaders make the right policy decisions most of the time. An ideal ideology should specify its goals, outline the, inst the institutional instruments and approach to the solution of national problems and spotlight in unambiguous terms its conception of the good society. I like that. The acceptance of a national ideology then makes the solution of problems less difficult. Resort to ad hoc policies or mutually inconsistent policies is, dis is discouraged. The solution of problems takes on a, di uh, uh, takes on a given format. The use of such an accepted format repeatedly should make the process of problem solution more efficient than before. The desire for guiding principles has encouraged a few African leaders to write pamphlets and tracts about the vision of the ideal society. Speaking of that, uh, check out Onita Say's uh, group on Discord, right, where recently uh, he has been engaged in writing a, a, a revolutionary pam uh, pamphlet, right, that that discusses the benefits amongst other things of why we need to be organized right of why we need to be organized and so make sure look him up the pro-black perspective and uh you know only to say and ask how can you be involved can you help how can you learn more importantly so this desire is not only this is this desire is felt not only among elected civilian administrations, but also in recent years more intensively among interventionist military regimes, which in most cases govern 
uh, countries in virtual ideological vacuum. Adding national ideas would help African countries avoid the pitfalls of neutrality with respect to the two major ideological blocs. A country wishing to play a constructive role in world affairs may be non-aligned, but it cannot in all honesty succeed in being neutral in all major political and economic issues. A distinctively African ide ideology will help African nations first to be pro-Africa and eventually to facilitate the achievement of African political integration. Discussing the issues of ideology on a national level, Ghana's Charter of the National Redemption Council argues, quote, a nation without vision, without uniting ideals and symbols, without a dependable machinery for, for thinking through and solving its problems, is no nation. For a nation is nothing if it is not a community, for shared hopes and ideals of shared symbols and values. Government of Ghana, 1972. Uniting national ideals and symbols may be provided by the adoption of some foreign ideology or by the intellectual thought of Africans. Capitalism and socialism, the two dominant economic ideologies, have time and again been suggested as suitable for Africa. Most civilian African leaders who have bothered to state their philosophical beliefs have for one reason or another labeled them as socialist. Though such philosophical models are largely rooted in African traditional mores. Thus, Neyere, in his specification of Ujama, describes it as our socialism and almost in the same breath, rejects capitalism and doctrinaire socialism. Ujama, who he says in 1968, quote, is opposed to capitalism, which seeks to build a happy society on the basis of exploitation of man by man. And it is equally opposed to doctrinaire socialism, which seeks to build its happy society on a philosophy of inevitable conflict between man and man. I like that, right? So either way you look at it, right? Capitalism or socialism, right? It's about creating a happy society on the conflict of men. You didn't get it now? Or you get it later. And then that, that, that's an interesting way to put that. At the end of the day, it's still it's still about the conflict between man and man. Either you're gonna get it right now, or you're gonna get it down the line. And the thing that we want, we want a a, 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 a African economic ideology. We, we we do want it to create a happy, quote unquote, happy society. But we want to do it without the conflict, either now or down the road, between ourselves, right? And, and, and this is the part of the unity, too, that I'm sure he's going to discuss. In the chat room, I got the pro-black perspective. He says, I want to see if he mentions industrialization. Yes, that's a good, that's, that's something to look out for. Shout out to the pro-black perspective in the chat room and the others who are watching live right now. In conscientiousism, Kwame Nkrumah states that philosophical conscientiousism upholds socialism and regards socialism as the definition of the desirable society in Africa. And that conscientiousism is the intellectual instrument of socialism in Africa. The description of such African philosophical postulates as Ujama of conscientiousism as socialism stems largely from the author's a priori value judgments. This tendency to tie their ideas to existing world ideas may be due to fear among African leaders of being labeled intellectual isolationists. Besides, these leaders are aware that the African audience of their generation is, in spite of their political sophistication, still subconsciously 
subject to certain modes of thought and behavior developed in the colonial period. And I, I talk about this all the time, right? I talk about this all the time in that the problem is uh, we have African folks, and we even as African people, right? We tend to do what was done before without question, and even when we're being quote unquote radical, quote unquote revolutionary, that is when we're stepping outside of uh, outside of the you know the bonds that we we previous uh, previously were, were were held by, we still tend to go back and do some of the same stuff again, and that's a that's a that is a a that is an action that we need to we need to lessen more and more. And again, that's why, again, if, you, if you're really gonna be revolutionary or radical or what have you, you have to set up an education system that's also revolutionary and radical. You look at independence in the Caribbean, uh, as great as uh, Maurice Bishop was, right? And I used to know a guy who, uh, who fought for Bishop. Uh, as great as Bishop was, still Grenada, and I know this for a fact, still followed the same educational system that the Brits had put in place there. Same thing in the Bahamas, Jamaica, etc. Still followed the same system, right? With maybe one or two changes, but still basically the same system. So what do you expect the people who are educated under those systems, what do you expect them to do? They're going to do more of the same of what came before. The same thing I'm, I'm damn sure about Africa, about the continent, countries in the continent, who wanted to say British rule or French rule or what have you. They carried out same thing with uh, Haiti in 1804. They still carried out some of the same modes of operation that the French had there. So, as well as paying them back too, by the way, right? So, you know, th that's something we're gonna have to, to get rid of, being subject to uh, certain modes of thought and behavior developed during the colonial period. According to this complex, anything good has to be of non-African origin, anything. African is derided and discriminated against as uncivilized, unsophisticated, and unscientific. Hence, in fashion, taste for music and entertainment on radio and television and in the system of education, right? So this, this sums it up again. You know, anything good has to be of non-African origin. I mean, we really still carry this, this kind of thinking on. Hence, in fashion, taste, of, taste for music and entertainment on radio and television and in the system of education. Africa deliberately sets out to ape the West. For Africa to attempt to seriously solve her problems, she may have to stop running after the shadow instead of the substance and find African solutions to her peculiar problems. This requires new institutional structures and a realistic ideology. Besides, there already exists a set of ideas and principles which govern the social and economic relations of the vast majority of Africans. The traditional African culture, based on the extended family system, intricate kinship relationships and the automatic social welfare provisions of the system, provides the basis of an African ideology, right? So let's read that again. Besides, there already exists a set of ideas and principles which govern the social and economic relations of the vast majority of Africans. The traditional African culture, based on the extended family system, intricate kinship relationships, and the automatic social welfare provisions of the system, provides the basis of an African ideology. So last time when we talked about this, and this came up in the chat room, KW Don 7, uh, at the end of the show, I didn't have a chance, I didn't see it until I shut down the stream, but at the end of the show, he mentioned that the, uh, the economic ideology that Africa needs to, to commit to 
is one based on you know the the, the, the Ubuntu communalism, right? Um, in in his economic strategy, and so um, this kind of this kind of echoes what the brother was saying there, right? Get back to the get back to the traditional African culture, the one based on the extended family, intricate kinship relationships, and the automatic social welfare. I am because you are provisions of the system, right? And that should be the basis of anything you do when you talk about an African economic ideology, right? So that that gives you a, a, a that gives you something to work with, right? That gives you something to start with. But is, you know, but is just saying that enough? Or do we gotta dig a little deeper? Do we gotta get a little bit more specific? So let's continue reading. African societies are not organized in a vertically ordered system of classes. Rather, they are largely composed of horizontally distinguishable competing ethnic groups. The major, if not the most dominant political problem facing these countries is not so much one of the, main, the, the maintenance of equilibrium in the relation between classes as that of promoting national integration through the peaceful coexistence of various ethnic groups. The analysis that looks appropriate for a class or a society may turn out to be out of place and irrelevant for an ethnic or a society. The realization of this difference calls on Africans to stop copying foreign models. They should stop depending heavily on Europe for their intellectual and physical needs. In fact, in the words of Achiampong in 1972, the time, quote, the time has come for us to stop trying to be second-rate Europeans. Our historic mission is to become first-rate Africans. This is a result that can and must be achieved by our, by, by, by our revolution. For ours is a revolution that must lead to the discovery of our capacity for self-reliance, fruitful cooperation, and purposeful self-development. Uh, I think I saw a tweet from Onita Say that says something similar this week in, in the sense of, um, you know, Africans have to stop trying to be second-rate Europeans. And that's so important, a concept. Uh, excuse me for a second. Let me pause here and grab some water. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Not the most professional. I apologize. I didn't. I didn't prep uh, before the show. So, what is now required is a clear and formal statement of ideals and principles pertaining to the Africans' idea of the good society, modes of behavior, and the process of moving towards such ideals, and the institutional changes and innovations required, like this. But before such a specification. We need to critically examine the two alternatives which are currently felt to be the only choices before Africa. The current accepted alternative. This is, this is the next section we're in here. The nature of the need to make a choice between capitalism and socialism becomes most pressing during crisis situations that characterize military takeovers and the displacement of alien businessmen. Should the new regime or the nation itself declare for one ideology or the other? With the expulsion of minority alien businessmen, should the government itself take over the businesses in an orgy of nationalization? Or should, or should it, in a fit of capitalist fervor, transfer these businesses to indigenous entrepreneurs? That's an interesting question. Several African countries have come face to face with this choice in the last few years. 
We may uh, now take a closer look at each alternative. So now we start with capitalism. The capitalist model entails private ownership and control of productive factors and a dichotomy between employers and employees. The profit motive is crucially important. The role of government is deliberately restricted to the natural utility sector and the provisions of certain infrastructure uh, facilities as the free play of market forces acting through the price system is expected to allocate resources efficiently. In the African context, capitalism takes a number of forms. First, there is a situation where foreign capitalists are given a free hand to completely dominate the economy. Countries in this category have their banking, insurance, wholesale, retail, plantation, agriculture, and foreign trade sectors completely controlled by foreigners. Such countries are securely tied to the apron string of developed uh, capitalist countries. After independence, foreign countries, oh, sorry, foreign, foreign companies who find themselves in this situation may try to mask the extent of their control by deliberately Africanizing the various cadres of their manpower. This strategy succeeds to the extent that the Africans place in decision making or supposedly decision making positions are sufficiently denationalized de in their attitudes as to place the interests of their employers above those of their nation. Hmm. This strategy su succeeds to the extent that the Africans place in the decision making or supposedly this decision making position are sufficiently denationalized in their attitudes as to place the interests of their employers above those of their nation. <clears throat> Second, there is a type of capitalism which, though predominantly controlled by foreign interests, deliberately gives a piece of the action to domestic capitalists. This may take the form of equity participation by indigenous private investors, and subcontracting jobs to small-scale indigenous capitalists. Third type obtains where the national government deliberately implements policies to transfer control of the national economy from foreigners to nationals. This may take the form of business um, indigenization and the outright expulsion of foreign business interests. Free market capitalist path has certain pitfalls which require some examination. <clears throat> the first consideration <clears throat> that most readily comes to mind is the fostering of income of, of, of income inequality. The capitalist businessman, due to his ownership or control of productive factors, is in a position to exploit workers by paying relatively low wages and attracting large-scale public patronage, especially if the government is well disposed to him. This tendency toward increasing income inequality is not discouraged by a program of business indigenization or even nationalism. Right? Um, indigenization, if successful, merely replaces the foreign businessman with a national. Again, you could see where the education problem is the issue, because it's highly problematic if you get away if you get rid of the foreign businessman and re just replace him with a with with a national businessman who who operates in the same way. There's no change. No change. There's no change for the nation. Income <clears throat> inequality may be reduced between foreigners and citizens if the takeover is efficient and operations are completely assumed by citizens. When, however, the takeover, even in the case of nationalization, is faulty, 
thus allowing for increased dependence on foreigners or closing of businesses due to indigenous ineptitude, the degree of income inequality may actually be increased, and low-income wage earners and in inefficient firms may lose their jobs. It is in this context that we should examine efforts by some African governments to reduce income inequality. The most prevalent measures are income redistributing fiscal and special programs. It is argued that these programs are necessary to correct the unjustifiable irrationality in income inequality. Cite is, however, loss of the fact that income distribution is in the last analysis determined by the economic system. Cite is, however, loss of the fact that income distribution is in the last analysis determined by the economic system. Yeah, the economic system doesn't, isn't concerned with, with that. As most African countries have significant capitalist sectors, the so-called private sector in any mixed economy, attempts at affecting national income redistribution without a simultaneous change in the system, which encourages and is itself supported by income inequality, would meet with ignominious defeat. Yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. For developing countries, a pure capitalist economic system may not yield optimal or near optimal investment decisions from the national point of view. Numerous large and small scale entrepreneurs largely motivated by the profit motive and a bandwagon psychology over invest in a particular industry, thus neglecting other industries where high social rates of return will have resulted from investment. As only a handful of these private sector businesses have access to national macroeconomic data, and as African governments make little or no effort to incorporate the private sector in their national development planning, there exists no effective uh, mechanism for directing scarce national investable resources to those sectors where they would contribute most to national well being. A major consequence of capitalism in certain African countries is the development of new economic and social attitudes. A profit-making businessman makes a decision concerning the utilization of profits, right? In the African context, the temptation to display wealth and indulge in luxuries is great. A distressingly large proportion of successful African businessmen spend their profits and the less economic, economically conscious ones, their capital on such frivolous items or expenditure as birth, marriage, and burial, cer burial uh, ceremony. That's an interesting concept too, right? In the African context, right? The temptation to display wealth and indulge in luxuries is great, right? A distressingly large proportion of successful African businessmen spend their profits, and the less economically conscious ones, their capital, huh, on such frivolous items of expenditure as birth, marriage, and burial ceremonies. You know, I'm sure you guys have long heard this thing of black folks are flashy for example right and that uh, you know a, a rich white guy could be in your midst and you wouldn't know it because he's not flashy he's wearing a pair of um uh nike monarchs you know air 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 monarchs or something like that some beat down jeans, a little shirt. And, and my grandmother used to point this out to me when I was coming up too. Whereas black folks will, you anyway, know, not all, not all of course, but you know, a lot of black folks will go and spend their last, you know, in some high end store to buy a belt or something like that. 
uh, I wonder what's the. I often wonder. Well, not often, because I don't think about it that much. But, but I wonder. Uh, here, reading it, what's the. What's the the evolutionary, so to speak, reason for that happening, right? These guys have plundered and pillaged all over the world, right? Stolen huge uh, amounts of money and resources from, from, from different peoples and, you know, ethnicities and whatnot. And yet... And yet you don't see them, you know, you don't see the average one of them flaunting it, right? All right. It's not until maybe you go to their house if you if you're into that kind of thing, uh, you might see it. But the African, even in this paper now, they're talking about how in the how in the African context, right, these display of wealth is like it's like a big thing. Right? So I often wonder what do you think is the cause of that? Others organize parties where large sums of money are pasted on dancers, send their children to exclusive schools abroad, buy newspaper advertisement space to make some uh, vain, glorious announcements. These are productly uneconomic ways of spending the investable surplus of a nation. Hence the high priest of the Third World Revolution, Fanon, 1967, has incisively remarked of colonial countries, which by now are independent states, right? Uh, he says, in quote, in colonial countries, the spirit of, in of indulgence is dominant at the core of the bourgeoisie. This is because the national bourgeoisie identifies itself with the Western bourgeoisie from whom it has learned its lessons. It follows the Western bourgeoisie along its path of negation and decadence without ever having emulated it in its first stages of exploitation and invention, stages which are an acquisition of that, uh, which are an acquisition of that Western bourgeoisie, whatever the circumstances, in its beginnings, the national bourgeoisie of the colonial countries identifies itself with the decadence of the bourgeoisie of the West. We need not think that it is jumping ahead. It is, in fact, beginning at the end. Uh, and by the way, when I was talking about that, that um, when I was talking about that, you know, the, how, you know, like my grandmother, for example, will, will talk about how white folks don't spend money on clothes. That's actually not true. Uh, I worked, I, I worked in some places, and I saw white folks spending major dollars on money and stuff like that. But we don't, we don't get to see it. We jump ahead, like this last quote just said. We jump ahead, and. Uh, we jump ahead and just follow the things that we think we see, right? In the chat room, Daily Affirmations by Pauline. Hey, what's up? Daily Affirmations by Pauline. Make sure you guys uh, follow Daily Affirmations uh, for her daily insight. She says in the chat room, the question is, do you prefer to walk around, to walk around with a 5K bag with nothing in it or a plastic bag with 5K in it? The cause, uh, the cause of us wanting to flash is to impress the Joneses. Yeah, I mean, but I, I still want to understand. I want to understand where that really begins, right? Um, you know, so anyway, going, uh, carrying on. If ever African countries are to reduce their dependence on aid from the outside world, they must first find some means of minimizing conspicuous consumption of investable surplus. <clears throat> right? That's I like how he put that to minimizing conspicuous consumption of investable surplus. And that's, you know, that's the thing of of how we should be running our even our personal lives. 
lives, right? In our personal lives, like like um like daily affirmations by Pauline just just said, uh you know, instead of walking around with a 5K bag with nothing in it, walk around with a, you know, a much cheaper bag, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be plastic, but walk around with a cheaper bag, right, with 5K in it. And not just that, don't just walk around with 5K, but invest the 5K. If the 5K is a surplus amount of money for you, Invest it. <clears throat> you know, I, for example, I buy stocks and stuff like that, right? If I see a stock, if I see something going on in the world that, that I feel a certain type of stock will um, <clears throat> bring in, you know, will, will, will increase, you know, per share immediately, I buy it. Uh, now, that's a slow way of going about it. You could do day trading or something like that and and bring your money up. But whatever it is, if you have a surplus of money after you've taken care of everything else, you take your surpluses, you invest it. And that happens on a personal level. That should be happening on a national nation building level as well. Let's not fuck off the money, you know, trying to be what we think is the equivalent of what these white folks are doing. It's not sustainable. This calls for new institutional ways of organizing economic activity, which have a built-in tendency to discourage irrational consumption patterns. Such institutional changes should nip in the bud incipient, incipient class consciousness in the relatively small modern sector of the economy the development of negative attitudes to education and discourage the idea that only the possession of money signifies success. You know, money doesn't make demand. A new system <clears throat> should have the ability to kindle the flame of commitment to national ideals and goals in all segments of society. So that brings us to the section on socialism. Before I read this section, let me remind you of KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to tune into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni. Inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. You guys couldn't hear me, sorry about that. Uh, so we had this section called socialism. Uh, and it goes that it is fashionable in post-independence Africa to be labeled socialist. As pointed out earlier in this essay, the few African leaders 
that have taken the trouble to identify their position in the, in the ideological spectrum have declared themselves socialists. This phenomenon may be due to the desire of these leaders to exercise more power and influence over their economies, which is provided for under the socialist model. Alternatively, it may be due to the apparent similarities between traditional African communalism and modern socialism. As I was saying with my uh, microphone muted accidentally just now, you know, we've talked about <clears throat> this African communalism quite a bit. And like I mentioned earlier in the show, KW Don 7 brought up this African communalism as the basis for um, this, uh, eco you know, the basis for this African economic ideology going forward. And, and that's the thing that Africans have done. Instead of you know, stepping out and being completely African, or what a lot of Africans have done is tied their traditional beliefs into some European ideology, right? Fundamentally making it European in nature, right? So to continue, whatever might be the reasons for the tendency of African leaders to embrace socialism in theory, Though they may be carrying through capitalistic policies, the African ideological horizon is littered with competing brands of socialism. These include scientific doctrinaire socialism, African socialism, pragmatic socialism, democratic socialism, and Ujama, as specified in the various writings and speeches of President Nyerere. Basing its analysis on traditional African values, Ujama rejects capitalism and exploitation of man by man. It advocates a form of public ownership of productive factors, either by direct government ownership or by bringing those factors under the control of peasants and workers through the government and cooperatives. Huh, peasants and workers, okay. Realizing the shortage of capital and skilled manpower, Ujama favors beginning, Ujama favors beginning the developmental process by organizing labor-intensive agriculture. Okay. A policy of self-reliance is deliberately pursued, particularly with regard to foreign capital. Ujama requires that the educational system here comes education again, all right? Be reformed from the elite producing colonial model to one more in tune with and in greater contact with a predominantly agricultural economy. Right? Earlier today in um, the Pro Black Perspectives episode, um, we, we heard a, a guy say something interesting, right? If, uh, how did it go again? It, essentially it was, if you owe me, um, if, if, if you owe me, I own you, right? I'm, I'm just paraphrasing him, but essentially if you owe me, if you're in debt to me, I own you. And, and, and only to say I had another, you know, version of saying it forgot how how it goes again but it's like you know uh if i only can eat when you feed me you control me right and so th this is why they would look at agriculture or an agricultural e economy first because you need to be able to feed yourself right again we are led by our stomachs right so you need to be able to feed yourself a lot of sellouts the African society are worried about being able to feed themselves and their families. So the first thing you want to do, especially uh, what uh, President uh, Nyerere was trying to do was distance yourself from these colonial powers completely. The first thing you want to do is be able to feed yourself, feed your people. If you cannot do that, you lose your nation. To succeed, Ujama requires dedicated and hardworking people willing to work in communal, large-scale farms 
under the guidance of good leadership, capable of developing good policies. The novelty and distinctiveness of Ujamaa, then, is its acceptance of African traditional communalism as its philosophical foundation, <clears throat> its down-to-earth common-sense solutions for economic problems, its rejection of doctrinaire ideological schools of thought, and the crucial role assigned to government in the organization of rural areas for development purposes. <clears throat> African countries now contemplating um, indigenizing their economies are looking for a new planning model to facilitate rural development and the involvement of the masses in national economic processes may do well to have a look at Ujamaa. Uh, based on the description of Ujamaa, what do you guys who are listening, be it live in the chat room or in the playback, you can comment in the comment section. What are you? What's your take on this idea um, that that Niere put forward? This idea of Ujama. How do you feel about it? Do you feel that it's? Do you feel that it's separated from the European philosophy of socialism enough? Uh, do you think it's a way forward for the continent? Drop your answers, and I'll read them live on the show. Uh, but before adopting it as a national economic blueprint, it is first necessary to take note of its prerequisites. And this is the important part. These are an economy in which the capitalist mode of production and behavior is not so strong as to warrant protracted and disruptive opposition to transition to an Ujamaa-type economy. A government controlled by special interest groups, desirous of improving the quality of life of the masses. The, availab the availability of a hardworking labor force and adequate land to allow large scale communal agriculture and the ability of government to give financial and technical assistance to commonly, uh, sorry, to communally owned economic enterprises. These are the prerequisites. Is this attainable to you guys? Is it attainable in that capitalism doesn't have such a, a hold on, you know, the continent, you know, in its uh, respective nations or, or what have you, so much so that, that that you won't have a, a huge disruption from the opposition, right, within, you know, towards this Ujamaa type economy, right? Because, you know, it's possible to change up the capitalistic system anywhere, you know, it's very possible to run the risk of civil war. The next prerequisite, is this attainable? to have a government that's uncontrolled by special interest groups. Right? Right now in America, a lot of what happens in governmental areas are these special interest groups with a lot of money behind it to throw at the people who can vote yay or nay on whether we do so, you know, on, on, on whether something is done in the country. Talked about it on the show before, but like I said on the show before, if you're in America, you'll understand what I'm talking about. They could have, what's it called again? Um, they could have a bullet train from New York to Florida or from New York to, you know, down south, or, you know, they could have that if they wanted it. But believe it or not, the special interest groups have said, nah. There could be a thing where you could be in Florida from New York in like, you know, three hours or something like that. Right? Which could open up the ability to say, well, I work uh, in Florida, I live in New York, or vice versa. Right? 
But the reason why it isn't happening is there's just special interest groups. So you have to, is that attainable? Is that something that, that we can get going in the continent? A government that's uncontrolled by special interest groups? And then the next thing is the availability, the, the availability of hardworking labor force and the land, you know, to be able to do large scale agriculture. Is that something that's, that's attainable? Is the, is the labor force willing to put in that kind of work to feed the nation? This one, I, I, I don't see as too much of a problem. But under, under capitalism, where if you could take advantage of others, you might not have as many people who are willing to actually get their hands dirty and do the work. And lastly, the ability of government to give financial and technical assistance to community-owned economic enterprises. Does the government have the resources, have the skilled persons or what have you? to give such assistance. And the things like these, if, if, if you're gonna go the Ujamaa route, these are some critical things you would have to think about. As well as what Oni Tase mentioned in the chat room earlier, you know, what are you doing about industrialization? Not just large-scale communal agriculture, but what are you doing about general industrialization in the nation? To continue, no African country, including Tanzania herself, can claim to have satisfied all these preconditions. However, an acquaintance with them is necessary for countries wishing to transform their economies in the direction outlined by Ujamaa. You know, in, in the chat room or in the comment section, uh, for those of you who, let's say you 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 follow the continent or, or a certain country or certain blocks of countries in the continent closely, which country which which countries in the continent are close or as this paper says familiar with or, or, or acquainted with um, these preconditions? Which ones today, I, I, I hope Tanzania still is, but other than Tanzania, which countries in the continent um, are familiar with these preconditions? The most common elements that run through the various socialist models are the acceptance of public ownership, thus rejecting private ownership, of productive factors, the theoretical transformation of the party in power into that of workers and peasants, though in actuality the real de facto leaders and decision makers are the usually small intellectual and business elites, and the rejection of exploitation of man by man. But how relevant, we may ask, is a model developed in 19th century Europe? And this is, a, this is a great question, right? This is a great question. Uh, in the chat room, I see to my question, uh, the pro-black perspective says, Nyerere got pretty close. Uh, and to that, I ask a follow-up question, where is Tanzania now? Is Tanzania still on that path? Are they closer? Or are they further, you know, since uh, Nyerere isn't, isn't the president anymore? But how relevant, we may ask, is a model developed in 19th century Europe based on the antagonisms, assumptions, and institutions of class-oriented societies to 20th century Africa confronted with economic underdevelopment and political, uh, so and potential ethnic conflict? The first shortcoming of the socialist path that comes to mind is the poor performances of public-owned corporations in modern Africa. Government corporation leaders 
and workers usually put in position by virtue of ethnic and political connections generally have no stake in their cooperations making profits. Interesting. Uh, losses, it is argued, will not lead to discontinuation of operations as annual government subventions keep these largely inefficient companies in business. The situation is not helped by frequent political interference by government, either in location of projects and organizational decision-making. Next is the inability <clears throat> or lack of will in avowedly socialist African countries to displace private operators in the retail and services sectors. <clears throat> Retailing is usually controlled by minority immigrant groups and by small-scale market women. We talked about these market women a couple of weeks ago as well, in one of the papers that we were reading, and how, like, like when we were talking about, you know, women's role in nation building and stuff like that, we talked about <clears throat> these market uh, women and how they were so adept at, at, at doing the work. Right? Uh, minority immigrant control has in some cases been eliminated by mass expulsion and deportation. The displacement of market women and other indigenous small scale operators is another thing. A rigid, implement, a rigid implementation of socialist principles with regard to the indigenous private sector would result in mass unemployment, and especially in the case of market women, in an abrupt discontinuation of a centuries-old marketing and distribution system, right? So if they went hardcore socialists, right, uh, the socialist principles with regard to the indigenous private sector would result in mass unemployment, especially in the case of the market women that we talked about in the past. Besides the replacement of a largely competitive retail system with monopolistic government-controlled distribution outlets may lead to reduced social welfare, particularly where these new government concerns are inefficient and take advantage of the monopoly situation to increase prices. In addition, the dearth of high-level manpower responsible for in inadequate capacity of African countries to implement their programs, militates against the adoption of a socialist mode of centralized economic planning. Inadequacies in personnel may lead to wrong investment decisions uh, with their attendant waste of scarce national resources. The social and economic needs of the masses, who in the last analysis are the supported beneficiaries of such planning may not be adequately taken into account. <clears throat> Bureaucrats and planners may make all the relevant decisions in air-conditioned offices in the capital cities, while such decisions have little capacity to affect the quality of rural life. And you know that's what that's what the idea of that quote that we put out that I read early in the paper. Right. Uh, essentially, uh, essentially, problems you know between man and man. Either you're gonna get them now, or you're gonna get them later. And that's the thing with socialism that people don't get is that yeah, it sounds good to say that the government or whatever will make the decisions, right? Will make the decisions between man and man. For example, like the government steps in. But understand the power that you're giving the government. And understand that, as this paper just said here, um, you know, that the, the economic needs of the masses will be the last will be the, you know, the, the, the needs of the mass will be the last needs met. The bureaucrats and the planners, these guys are gonna make their decisions from their lofty place. 
not being t totally immersed, not being totally engaged in in the poor man, so to speak, right? And so these decisions and plannings will will just benefit a certain group again. So it, at the end of the day, it's still going to be you know man versus man. Either you're going to get it today, or you're going to get it later. And that's because these ideologies, quite frankly, as we, as uh, only to say, talked about on his, sh on his show today, you know, these have a, these have a, a fundamentally European mindset behind them. You know, it, it, if you look at history, you look at how Europeans didn't care for Europeans themselves. You want to talk about uh, men? hating their women and all that kind of stuff check the european history you want to talk about men being indifferent to children check the european history so that's what they, if that's what they did amongst themselves you could forget about what their ideology is going to do for african people to continue moreover the socialist analysis of class antagonism an eventual conflict is, ir is irrelevant for the African situation. Ours are multi-ethnic, not class audit societies. In spite of the efforts of colonial capitalism to create middle-class bourgeoisies for a greater part of the 20th century, the small size of the middle class, which is the civil servants, soldiers, teachers, members of the professions, businessmen, in African countries is a living testimony to the signal failure of such efforts. What Africa needs is not a system which encourages conflicts, but one which encourages various segments of society to complement one another. That's, that's a word right there, I like that, right? This calls for a system which encourages social and economic cooperation on a national basis. And that brings us to a part of paper called a suggested model. Uh, let me take a water break. So I'm going to go to the station ID. I'll be right back. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is DA asking you to into the Harsh Reality Podcast, providing you with social commentary on the news affecting our community, only on KWAZ Radio. Peace family, this is Oni, inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective, where black problems are addressed with black solutions. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. And we're back. We're a little bit more hydrated. We are also appreciative for those of you who are live with us in the chat room tonight. Those of you, and we're also appreciative of those of you who are listening to the playback. Much, much appreciated. Uh, we're reading this paper here. Uh, and we reached section called a suggested model. We're talking about a uh, suggested model for African economics, or for, for an African economic ideology. And now we've reached a part of the paper. After talking about capitalism and socialism, we're talking about the suggested model for Africa. <clears throat> and again, this conversation was born out of our conversation in the last episode uh, this past Thursday. And uh, I figured this would be a good paper to come back with on on Saturday or today. Um, so make sure if you haven't checked out the previous episode, check that out as well. And check out all the, you know, all the, the episodes that are on uh, YouTube. So we have a suggested model <clears throat> that goes, the aims and goals of a new economic order in Africa should first be identified before a specification of the institutional and structural details of the new model. Given the present economic problems resulting from Africa's situation of political, cultural, and economic subjugation in the last century, these goals of a new economic system should incorporate local control of most economic activities. Right? So that's one of the first things we want, local control. 
of most economic activities, an equitable distribu distribution of national income among all segments of society, rational use of national resources to promote and stimulate economic activities, a drastically reduced dependence on non-African sources, an increased self-reliance in matters of manpower, markets, and the solution of problems. The proposed system takes into serious consideration the economic problems confronting African nations and seeks to solve these with the aid of institutional innovations. Realizing that probably the most pressing economic problems of Africa today are unemployment, inflation, balance of payments, uh, balance of payments disequilibrium, and migration from rural to urban areas resulting from the unjustifiable neglect of rural areas. The proposed model incorporates a new initial setup to facilitate increased production to help solve these problems. Okay, so let's, let's read that again. Uh, in the chat room, KW Don, hey, what's up, hey, uh, what's up, KW Don 7? Uh, the concept of, of Ujamaa will not be easily embraced by the upper middle class and the black bourgeoisie. This is one of this is one of groups that opposed Thomas Sankara during his reign in Burkina Faso. Yeah, uh, that's why <laughs> you know when we talk about when we talk about Africa. Uh, and we usually tend to, on this show, this uh, podcast network, et cetera, we usually talk about, you know, th there's going to be a need for uh, war, right? And <clears throat> quite frankly, <clears throat> change most oftentimes comes after some kind of conflict. You have to win the conflict and then implement the change. And as this paper suggested, uh, because of, of who KW Don 7 pointed out, that upper middle class, that bourgeoisie uh, class, uh, they have the means, right, to, to create a, a huge problem for you in implementing anything new in those countries within the continent. They have the means to have their own armies formed, et cetera. Because again, people will follow, you know, the ability to feed themselves. Okay, these rich folks are paying us to fight, to protect them and to protect their ideology. There's people who will, who will fight. They will take that money. And you're gonna have to figure out, we, we are gonna have to figure out a way, you know, to prevent that, which sounds like you'll have to match monies. So yeah, so there's gonna be a huge problem, you know, not only against uh, these European powers, but we're gonna have a huge problem just changing the realities within the continent. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you something interesting. I worry about that last one more than I worry about the former. Because I believe once you get Africa together, no European country could match. That'll be a wrap for it. But the difficulty is going to be getting Africa in order. You see? And let's be real about it. Uh, it's the people outside of the content. Remember I always say Africa awaits its creator and its creations? It's gonna be a lot of people outside of the continent who are gonna have to go in there with these different ideas, this different outlook. And that itself is gonna cause some friction because you, you can't go into people's country, right? Trying to move things around as if 
the people themselves don't have a say in what moves around. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole, it's a whole mess. And frankly, we gotta start really sitting down and talking, instead of just saying things, well, we gotta unify and all this, and instead of just saying things, we gotta really sit down and think about a stepwise approach to this thing. We have to really sit down and think about a stepwise approach to how we're gonna change the mindset Right? How, how are we gonna deal with the bourgeoisie, the, the elites in these countries who are, you know, full participants in the colonial mindset, et cetera? And, 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 and why wouldn't they be? They eating high off the hog, so to speak. <clears throat> how do you change that? Right? That's a huge obstacle for the people who could band together and control uh, whole militaries in these countries. How do you how do you deal with that? In addition, it suggests a recognition of a new productive sector, the communal sector, within which farming in the rural areas will be reorganized into medium and large scale operations. Before specifying our new model. It is of interest to examine the economic system in operation in most African countries today. It is often referred to as mixed economy as it provides for government participation as well as private enterprise capitalist businesses. Thus, most African countries have two broad production sectors, the public sector and the private. A close examination of these economies reveals that the public sector corporations are grossly inefficient due to certain cumbersome administrative practices in that sector, while the private sector is predominantly in the hands of foreigners or minority immigrant groups whose overriding interest is the exploitation of the country and the repatriation of profits. The indigenous capitalist class is in most African countries rather rudimentary, right? Thus prompting, the indigenous capitalist class is in most countries rather, rather rudimentary, thus prompting a number of governments to devise special programs such as in, uh, boy, this word is killing me tonight, um, indigenization and trade licensing programs to strengthen and increase the ranks of indigenous participation in national economies. It is, therefore, clear that most African countries have the worst elements of state participation, i.e. inefficiency, and of private enterprise participation, i.e. foreign control in their economies. These countries do not merely have a mixed economy system. More importantly, the nature of this mixed economy is its decadence and its inability to promote such growth in national output that will substantially raise the living standard of the masses. Under the present system, the public sector includes such industries as large-scale manufacturing, for example, iron and steel, petrochemicals, car assembly, uh, strategic industries from the point of view of national security, like ammunition, arms, security, printing, um, then transportation, airways, railways, communications, telecommunications, postal services, and the utilities, water, electricity, roads, and port facilities. The other major productive sector, the private sector, incorporates the banking industry, large to small scale industries, the services industries, and agriculture. It would be wrong to assume that these two sectors are not interdependent. Rather, it is to be expected that inefficiency in the public sector has important repercussions on the private sector. For example, intermittent and unreliable utility supply has the effect of driving up production costs of manufacturing 
of, of, of manufacturing industries in the private sector. The lack of in, inadequacy of transport facilities makes the evacuation of agricultural output from the producing areas more difficult and more expensive, thus creating scarcities in the consuming areas. Also, an inefficient and declining, an inefficient and declining agriculture has the effect of raising prices of food and industrial raw materials in both the private and public sectors. So this brings us to a part of the paper called the model. So let's see what the model is. The model, um, in this model, we propose three major production sectors. These are process damping and sideways. Uh, these are the public sector, the private sector, and the communal sector. This diagram shows you the present system, right? We have the national economy. You have the national economy that breaks down into the public sector and the private sector, right? So this kind of just regurgitates what I just read. The public sector includes your large scale industries, iron and steel, petrochemicals, car assembly. Uh, it, 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 it includes utilities and strategic um, areas. It includes transportation and communication. The private sector includes the banks, the industries, large scale to small scale. It includes services and agriculture. The proposed system, which is what I'm gonna read about now, just as a preview, has in the public sector pretty much the same configuration, right? Except the banks are now in the public sector. And in the private sector, wait, am I reading this right? Yeah. And in the private sector, you have the, ma the manufacturing, the medium to small scale industries, services, and in the communal sector, which again, we're gonna read about this in a second, but this is our little preview. You have the agro-based industries, agriculture, and wholesale of agri and agri-based industrial output. Okay, so let's read about it a little further. So again, this model has three areas, the public sector, private sector, and the communal sector. Before reading about it, do you guys in the chat room, what do you guys think about this idea of the model being split into these three areas? And we looked at the components of each, of each area, right? What do you guys think of these three areas being the public sector, the private sector, and the communal sector? We assume that the recent practices of infusing new blood into public corporations and the discipline and removal of the, of the inefficient in some African countries will spread in the future. That's a heavy assumption. We also assume that the governing bodies of these corporations would in future be predominantly made up of representatives of the communal and private sector. That's a hell of a assumption too, right? Uh, familiar with the technicalities of their particular corporations. We make the further assumption that sooner or later, most, agri uh, most African countries will undertake some, some form of um, indigenization of their economies and that African capitalists cannot effectively take over all the industries now in the private sector. We make the final assumption that farmers are rational and would accept suggestions designed to increase their productivity and income, <clears throat> provided such programs will not involve the government in activities constraining their freedom of choice. Boy, these assumptions are heavy. Okay. In the proposed economic system, <clears throat> We include utilities, large-scale industries, strategic industries, transport, communication, and a new addition, the banking industry, in the public sector. The new private sector 
would now include medium to large scale non-manufacturing industries, manufacture of consumer goods. So you want consumer goods in the private sector and the services industries. <clears throat> it excludes the banking industry for reasons we specify below and agriculture, which now forms the backbone of the new communal sector. The communal sector includes agriculture, agro-based industries, and the, and the, whole, and the wholesale of agricultural and agro-based output. <clears throat> Given the assumptions made above, the improved public sector would provide more efficient services, which would have the effect of lowering production and, and evacuation costs in the private and communal sectors. So let me read that again. Given the assumptions made above, the improved public sector would provide more efficient services, which would have the effect of lowering production and evacuation costs in the private and communal sectors. Okay. This would improve the investment atmosphere and set the stage for general increases, right, in output and employment opportunities. Inflation would be checked part of the increase in domestic output, particularly in rural agriculture, would be made available for exports and thus help reduce balance of payment deficits. Think about that for a second. Inflation will be checked. Part of the increase in domestic output, particularly in rural agriculture, would be made available for exports and thus help reduce balance of payment deficits. In the chat room, uh, Pro Black Perspective says, I'd like to see how he justified public sector banking. It's a complicated, yeah, that's, that, that was the first thing that hit me too. Public sector banking? Okay. The new private sector would develop closer links with the public. The public sector, uh, the public sector officials responsible for national economic planning would provide macroeconomic data on a continual basis to the private sector to help that sector make the right investment decisions as regards the needs of the country and profit profitability of the companies themselves. In addition, the government would, through fiscal devices, discourage conspicuous consumption. Prohibitively high rates of taxation could be levied on street parties, uh, quote unquote, spraying of cash, vainglorious announcements in national news media, and other luxury items necessitated by class snobbishness. Conversely, attractive tax concessions could be offered those businessmen reinvesting their profits in their companies. Well, that makes sense, right? You gotta, because as with anything, you have to ask, you, ha you always have to ask the question, why would someone do this, right? You have to ask the question, why would someone do this? And if you wanna get folks, you know, businessmen reinvesting profits in their companies, to, to raise the standards of living for the employees, you know, you got to give them some incentive, right? And, and that's what they say here. Conversely, attractive tax concessions could be offered those businessmen re reinvesting their profits in their companies, raising the standard of living of their employees, and contributing to self-help projects. What are self-help projects? The communal factor requires a fairly detailed elaboration as it is the new sector in a formal sense. However, a close examination of events in the last few years indicates that the communal sector is not a new concept in some African communities. For example, in certain parts of Nigeria between 1967 and the early 1970s, there have occurred increased rural communal activities raising funds for development purposes and organizing large-scale agricultural projects. 
the potential of the communal sector becomes crucially important for the involvement of the masses in national economic processes. The encouragement of large-scale farming, capable of attracting agricultural credit and utilizing modern agricultural inputs. The communal sector would be based on agriculture in the rural areas, as it is now generally realized that the low levels of productivity and production in agriculture are largely due to one-man, small-scale operations utilizing outmoded tools. We propose that the communal sector will be made up of groups of farmers, with each group owning and operating each farm. Each group could be made up of a minimum of 10 to 20. The process of grouping should not be forced by government. Farmers would be left to choose other farmers they can work with harmoniously. Where the scale of operation is large enough, each communal farm may employ its technical and managerial personnel who may or may not be members of the community, but whose retention of their jobs would depend on their ability to organize the activities of the, of the enterprises profitably. Doesn't it seem like there's a problem just waiting to happen inside here? Uh, each communal enterprise would have an economic committee. And, you know, I, I have to be careful when I say that because I don't want to be, you know, this Afro pessimist or whatever, but something in there doesn't seem right. Each communal enterprise would have an economic committee which gives policy guidelines to managers and decides on the, on the disposal of profits. Thus, it is possible that after settling all financial obligations, including payment to members of the communal farm in proportion to their individual efforts, part of the profits could be contributed to community development projects, such as grants to local schools, the building of community centers, and other projects designed to make life more comfortable, if not more enjoyable, to the masses. Here's a question for you guys who are on live with me tonight. Um, when designing, you know, when designing this, this, what we call uh, African economic ideology, right? Um, should we, should we, uh, you know, or, or, or any ideology, should we also consider the human, the general human nature of people? Should we consider that as well, right? And again, this is where the education that I keep talking about comes in as well. You have to raise up certain people to have a certain mindset. If you want, if you want change, you have to. If you want something done better, you have to teach people how to do it better, right? So, part of this is that you would have to really ch change up the mindset of 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 generations as they come up. In, in my humble opinion, the links of the communal sector with the government will be such as to facilitate interchange of information for planning purposes and the transmission of funds and other technical assistance from the government to the communal farms. At the initial stages, government economic technicians would advise the communal farms as regards the profitability of crops, the preparation of pre-investment studies for agro-based industries, and, and the marketing of their output. Communal businesses, if properly organized, if properly organized, right? That's the assumption and the ifs that, that kind of doesn't sit well with me, right? Uh, communal businesses, if 
organ if properly organized, would increase agricultural production at a rapid rate, helping the fight against unemployment, inflation, and external deficits, improve the quality of rural life, and thus check the precipitate the precipitate migration of the bored rural underemployed to the rapidly overcrowding cities. The chat room, I, I want to read that last part again, but in the chat room, the pro-black perspective says human nature may change with the political economy. That's, that's true. That's true. Uh, communal businesses, if properly organized, would increase agricultural production at a rapid rate. Okay. Helping the fight against unemployment, true. Inflation and external deficits. Improve the quality of rural life. And that's the important thing, right? Improve the, qu the quality of rural life and thus check the precipitate migration of the bored rural unemployed to the rapidly overcrowding cities. I like that. I like how that sounds. So this takes us to a part of the paper called Implications for the banking industry. So here only Tasse may get might get his answer. Implications for the banking industry. We now come to a consideration of the crucial role of the banking industry in the model. The effectiveness of monetary policy in the achievement of national objectives demands large depends largely on the organization and ownership of commercial banks and the power at the disposal of the central bank. A monetary system where the commercial banks are mere foreign subsidiaries or branches of large foreign banks may be one in which the central banks' manipulation of traditional credit policy instruments are neutralized by the activities of, the, of these foreign banks. Okay. Foreign controlled commercial banks have for a long time demonstrated that their interests lie predominantly in the financing of foreign trade and foreign-owned companies in Africa. The needs of indigenous businessmen have been largely ignored. Realizing the crucial importance of money supply, especially in regard to aggregate expenditure, price level, and the balance of payments, and the balance of payment situation, the monetary, the monetary sector should be regarded as a very sensitive sector whose control should not be left with competing capitalists and often foreign-owned companies. I got you. I got that. The banking sector, by, by the way, these, when you have these foreign banks in your country, is something you'll always notice. These foreign banks participate heavily in the brain drain of a country by offering these scholarships and stuff uh, to send folks out of the country. Now, sometimes, you know, they have a stipulation where you have to come back to the country and, and work and kind of serve your time out or whatever. But oftentimes, um, it's a one-way ticket out. Uh, the banking sector should be taken over completely by the government. This would not be a major radical break in many African countries where private and government commercial banks exist side by side. Neither can it be considered as nationalization for the sake of nationalization. Rather, it is an action which takes the vital interests of the nation as paramount. The medium of exchange and numeraire is now under complete national control and the profits of the highly lucrative banking sector now accrue to the nation as a whole. Brings us to a section called uh, Impl Implications for National Economic Planning. So uh, what are you guys' thoughts on government controlling the banks, and the idea that with the government controlling the banks, uh, a lot of those profits can accrue uh, 
can accrue to the nation as a whole. Implications for national economic plan. This model will require a planning machinery radically different from what most African countries now use. It demands a highly decentralized planning model. It calls for planning from below. But before we specify the outlines of the new planning model, we should look at the flaws of the model largely in use now. From available evidence, most African planning models are a hybrid of two planning approaches. These are conventional planning, which seeks to maximize benefits through rational choice of means from available alternatives to achieve specific objectives, and partial planning, which is an initiative, oh, sorry, which is an which is an intuitive and piecemeal mode of planning. The conventional approach starts the planning process by setting objectives and then goes on to set targets, select policies and projects, devise a strategy for, for achieving set targets, reconcile resources with requirements, and solve essential social problems. This reminds me of when I was uh, taking the uh, project management certification. This planning model is unsuitable for Africa for the following reasons. First, the objectives, usually unspecific in nature, are selected without first specifying the social problems to be solved. Second, the lack of reliable statistics on most African economies puts into great doubt the relevance of a centralized planning model, where most of decisions regarding needs and priorities are made by bureaucrats in the capital cities. Even with reliable statistics, the peculiar local needs of rural areas cannot adequately be encompassed by policymakers in the planning agency. Third, the consideration of essential social needs at the tail end is rather curious, for these needs are largely the raison d'etre of the planning exercise itself, right? The main reason. A planning model for our three-sector economy would largely reverse the procedure of the conventional model. It would largely minimize the role of government in active participation in directly productive enterprises. The government would merely spell out the chronological sequence of the planning exercise, provide technical and financial aid to communal public and private enterprises in identifying and studying feasible investment projects, and with guidance from his contacts with these enterprises, identify the pressing social problems to be solved within a plan, period. For under the suggested planning model, the process starts with the identification of the essential social problems. Uh, social, social problems to be solved. It then goes on to reconcile these with, a, with available resources, devise a strategy for resolving the problems, set targets and time horizons, and choose overall objectives based on the social problems to be solved. Not only would government draw up its own plan, but more important, if the quality of rural life is to be significantly affected by the planning exercise, communal enterprises would also draw up their individual development plans based on the official planning model. In the chat room, uh, he only to say from the pro-black perspective says he didn't really explain the public banking. I think banking is risk-taking. It's questionable if the government or public should take those risks. Yeah, uh, generally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting thought as well. You, you, you don't want the government taking 
those big risks that affect you heavily. Um, and you might not want the, the noise of the public, um, you know, interfering with with those risks. So what? So then, what's the alternative? Right. What's the alternative? You you just prefer the private sector, you know, to control the banking and 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 take, you know, and take the risk for uh, the people or for the nation. I don't know. I have to sit down. I have to sit down and think about that one a little bit further. Uh, other implications. Although the government would still participate in certain directly productive activities, which may be considered as constituting the so-called commanding heights of the economy, we have shifted the emphasis from direct participation to effective intervention. Efficiency in the provision of social and economic infrastructure is a type of intervention that lowers production costs in both private and communal sectors. The government would now concentrate all its energies to the industries included in the public sector and avoid dabbling uh, ineptly in other sectors. Let me read that again. The government would now concentrate all its energies to the industries included in the public sector and avoid dabbling ineptly in the other sectors. An important aspect of the proposed system is the provision made for popular participation in the national economy under the communal sector. <clears throat> Farmers would now cooperate to set up and run farms and contribute part of their profits to socially relevant programs. This increases community spirit and lessens the burden of government in the provision of social amenities. The gap between urban amenities and rural neglect would be lessened by increased government aid to rural communal enterprises and the self-help programs <clears throat> of communal enterprises. This would have the effect of creating attractive alternatives to urban centers in the rural areas, thus lessening the mounting strains of urban facilities. The effects on the political front are likely to be revolutionary. Okay, here we go with the word revolutionary. The communal enterprises will acquire substantial bargaining power in the disposal, in, in the disposal of national output, government expenditure, and the extent of tax incidence on our culture. Thus, for the first time in modern African history, farmers may constitute a formidable force in national politics if the various communal businesses organize single lobbies in capital cities. Then democracy would have been transformed into reality, for the masses would not only now participate in the economic processes, but also influence the political decision-making mechanisms of Africa. For too long, Africa has groped for meaningful ideological guidelines. The system we have outlined above is relevant to the African situation. Besides, it provides for mass participation. Africa needs to move ahead. She needs a new utilitarian mixed economy. And that is the end of the paper. So aside, so I guess banking and what sector you put banking is the big issue uh, with the paper. And as KW Don Seven pointed out, you know you're gonna have a big problem with the elites, the African elites, trying to and trying to establish uh, this new economic order in Africa. Uh, does anyone else have a comment about the paper? Thoughts, comments about the paper? Anyone else in the chat room? So, um, 
we're coming up on these uh, holidays here and nothing's going to stop here. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be doing a show uh, regularly this week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And the Kwanzaa week, I'm, I'm, my intention is to do a couple of shows that week. Uh, I hope you do tune in for it. I, I do think I want to follow up on this paper in the future. So look out for me doing a follow up to this paper. Uh, and also, don't forget, we, we do want to have that discussion again about the steps towards unity um, in the continent. Unity even amongst us outside of the continent. And so um, that, may, that will probably also happen at Kwanzaa week as well. So it seems like there's no other uh, questions or comments. I hope you guys enjoyed the paper. I hope it at least gives some thoughts on, on how we can develop a new economic ideology on the continent amongst African people. Uh, and as only to say from the pro-black perspective said in the chat, this made me think, think deep on the banking question. That's, that's the next thing I'm gonna do my research on because I gotta do research on it to fit, to see how banking really fits uh, when you talk about you know nation building and, and economic ideology. So that's something I'm gonna as well, really sit down and, and go over, um, go over some knowledge, um, some knowledge areas on banking. So I appreciate you bringing up that, that point about banking. It really stuck out to me and now I got to go and do my due diligence. Uh, but anyway, I hope um, you guys enjoyed the paper. I hope we can discuss it further even after this episode has ended. Till next time, guys, this has been the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I will see you on Tuesday. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Beta Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, betamedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, Instagram, Beta Medicine.